ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد في الاولين وفي الاخرين وفي الملا الاعلى الى يوم الدين يقول عز من قائل يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون brothers and sisters these are undoubtedly extremely blessed days these are according to the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the greatest days of the year and today which is yawmul jumu'ah friday happens to be the best friday of the year because it is a friday that falls within the first 10 days of dhul hijjah and so we should be aware of how critical this moment is in our lives, our spiritual lives, and our connectedness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I remind myself, as I reminded you two weeks ago, to take advantage of every moment of these days, to be in a state of worship, prayer, begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness, doing as much good as you can possibly do, giving charity, visiting your neighbors, visiting a sick person asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to elevate the condition of our people to relieve this world of the hardship don't waste time in anything but the remembrance of Allah there are only a few days left <clears throat> in two days it will be the day of Arafah which is that magnificent day as the Hujjaj will stand on the day of Arafah begging and beseeching and imploring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asking for forgiveness that is a day that the Prophet said if you fast on that day <clears throat> he anticipates that you will receive forgiveness for two years the year that precedes and the year that comes and so be sure to fast the day of Arafah and use that day to ask Allah and beg him for forgiveness for our shortcomings may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to worship him on that day Allahumma ameen ya rabbil alameen Brothers and sisters, these days of Dhul Hijjah, they are days where we re remember the legacy of the father of prophets, Ibrahim alayhi salam. This man who the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam taught us that he is the most likened to him in terms of physical looks. But Allah, when speaking about Ibrahim alayhi salam in the Quran, speaks to us about a magnificent man. He says that Ibrahim alayhi salam kana ummah. He was a nation. Qanitan lillah. Devoutly obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hanifan. Inclined towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Walam yakum min al mushrikeen. And he was not someone who associated partners with Allah. Ibrahim alayhi salam the father of prophets was a man who was tremendously devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In every way, shape, or form, he devoted his life to Allah. And then Allah continues to tell us, Shakiran li an'umihi. He was a man who was greatly thankful for the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon him. So it wasn't just that he was devout and he was committed to Allah. And there was no associating partners with Allah. But Ibrahim alayhi salam felt indebted to Allah for all of the blessings, the blessings of guidance, the light of Allah having entered into his heart. He was thankful for those blessings. Shakiran li an'umihi. And so Allah says, Ijtabahu wa hadahu ila sirat mustaqim. That he then chose him and guided him to the straight path. That is who Sayyiduna Ibrahim alayhi salam is and that's why Allah commands our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam two verses later an ittabi'a millat, millata Ibrahim he commands our beloved messenger Muhammad 
as well commanding us to follow the way of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Take him as your guide, as your way through this dunya. And so brothers and sisters, there is much to reflect on with regards to the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam. But I want to share with you one aspect of his legacy that we are in dire need of in this day and age. One fundamental feature that we see in the life of Ibrahim alayhi salam, at every juncture, every turn, we see that he was an individual who was undoubtedly devoted, subservient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and ready and willing to sacrifice everything he had to ensure that he was fully and beautifully devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From his younger years as a young boy, when he knew that what his father and what his family and what his people were following was wrong, he sacrificed his closeness to his family to say, what you're doing is not pleasing to Allah. And they rejected him categorically as we know. But not only did they reject him, but they chose now that we have to kill you, Ya Ibrahim. And so they built a towering fire <clears throat> to throw Ibrahim alayhi salam into it. They went to the level that not only do we not accept your beliefs, Ya Ibrahim, and we find it offensive, we find it dis creating discord in our society, the only solution is to kill you. He was a young man. And so they threw him into the fire. But as we know, he was utterly devoted to Allah. He already sacrificed his proximity to his family. And now he was ready to sacrifice his own life. So he was thrown into the fire. And what we come to learn is that the angel Jibreel came to Ibrahim. And he said to him, what do you ask of me? What can I do for you? And because Ibrahim was utterly devoted to Allah, he said, فَأَمَّا مِنْكَ فَلَا شَيْءٍ I don't need anything from you, Ya Jibreel. However, from Allah, حَسْبِي اللَّهُ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلِ From Allah, I say with utter confidence, Allah is sufficient for me, and He is the best one to depend on. In the moment when He's in the fire, His devout nature is fully present where he does not even require or want the help of Jibreel, an angel who was sent to him. He only says, I need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was the color of his commitment. That was the nature of his commitment. Beautifully devout. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him challenge after challenge to test how devout he was. And they only got stronger. They only got harder. In the tender old age of 70, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him finally with a son. A child that would warm his heart and would carry the message further. And as an infant, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I want you to take your wife Hajar and take your son Ismail and I want you to put them in the middle of the barren desert. What a difficult request. What a difficult ask. And Ibrahim alayhi salam, he was devout. But it was not easy. It was obviously extremely hard. And so he took his child. And he took his beloved wife, Hajar. And he placed them in the desert. And he began to walk away. And so Hajar said to him, why are you doing this? Why are you leaving us here? He had no words for her. He didn't know how to explain that his commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his devout nature required him to make such a tough decision. And so she paused and she looked at him. And this goes to show you her devout nature. Our mother Hajar was a devout woman. She said to him, 
Allah Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala command you to leave us here? He nodded. He said, then go. Allah will never lead us astray. Allah will never forsake us. That was a devout woman who was ready and willing to sacrifice everything for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the challenges got even harder. Where as Allah tells us in Surah Al-Safat, فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ مَعَهُ السَّعِي Now Ibrahim was a young man, young boy, nine, ten years old, walking beside his father. And Allah describes Ibrahim, Ismail as being غلام حليم. Not just any young boy or young man, but this was a good boy. This was a, a forbearant boy, a gentle boy, committed to his father and his mother in their service, smart, intelligent, capable. And so Allah says, now Ibrahim has his son Ismail next to him, walking together, journeying through earth. But he falls asleep and he sees a vision. And he tells his son, Inni ara fil manami anni azbahuk. Oh my son, I received a vision last night that I am to sacrifice you. So Ibrahim says to his son Ismail, Fanzur madha tara. What do you think? You know, subhanAllah, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he was devoted. But his devotion was one that was not just blind and empty. But it was one that was so profoundly engaging that he wanted to ensure that his son understood what this was. And so he said, he asked him, Oh son, what do you think about what God has decreed? And this shows you Ismail's utter devotion and utter willingness to sacrifice. He responds by saying, Ya Abati, oh my beloved father, Ifal ma tu'mar. Do what you are commanded to do. See, the, Ibrahim said to him, Inni ara, I see a vision. But Ismail was so in tune and so understanding and intelligent, he knew that his father's vision as a prophet was a command, was a dictate. So he said, Ifal ma tara, you do what you are commanded to do. Satajiduni insha'Allah min al sabirin. You will find me by God's permission amongst the patient. Allahu Akbar. Look at the commitment of a family, a father, a wife, a son. All of them are committed and devout to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to his decree. Willing to sacrifice all of them. A mother sacrificing her son, a father sacrificing his beloved son, a son saying, I accept the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah says, فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَا When they submitted themselves, when they made themselves subservient, فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَا وَتَلَّهُ لِلْجَبِينَ And Ibrahim alayhi salam, he took the head of his son Ismail. وَتَلَّهُ لِلْجَبِينَ means that he put his head down and his son's head was trembling. Just as you you know when you, when you slaughter something, what happens? Your hand will tremble, the head will tremble. Imagine as Ibrahim is holding his son's head down and he raises his hand to come and slaughter, to come and sacrifice his son. Ibrahim. At that moment, Allah calls out and he says, Ya Ibrahim, O oh Ibrahim, you have been truthful. You have shown your commitment to my decree. That this, he tells him, was the greatest test. The greatest sacrifice that any human being will ever be asked to make to show how devout they are to me. And you have been truthful. You have passed. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar kabira walhamdulillahi kathira. And so Allah says, We gave him in its place a dhibhin azim, a sheep to be slaughtered, or a ram. Brothers and sisters, 
I want us to answer one question in this first khutbah. What are we committed to? What are we devoted to? And what are we willing to sacrifice for that? Because undoubtedly, the greatest blessing that we have in this human existence is the gift of La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. That we've been gifted with subservience to Allah and been gifted with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not asking us to make the sacrifice that Ibrahim made because that is a sacrifice that only he was asked to make. What is Allah asking of you and I? He's asking us to wake up early in the morning, five o'clock, six o'clock, and pray Fajr on time. Sacrifice some sleep, sacrifice the warmth of your bread to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wants you to sacrifice your phone and your endless stream of YouTube and Netflix to put that down and to read some Quran. He wants you to sacrifice that extension to your home or that 2016 car that you want to buy and give that money where it belongs to those who need it, to those who are struggling in this earth, those who are dying because of thirst and hunger and disease. He wants you to sacrifice your minimal co comforts for comforts for others. He wants you to sacrifice your ego to bring harmony to this world. It is the ego that is bringing so much destruction and death to this world. So much discord. Where we otherize one another, where we hate one another. It's because of our ego and what Allah wants us to sacrifice in these blessed days is say, I'm okay. I see the other person. I love the other person. I have compassion for others. I have empathy for others. That is the legacy of our prophets. Brothers and sisters, in these blessed days of Dhul Hijjah, we have to ask ourselves, are we going to sacrifice or not? Because Allah keeps on sending us these profound moments, these beautiful moments, these illuminated moments, to go back, to revise who we are, to shift our states. And because of our commitment to our lower carnal desires, we're not willing to sacrifice even the smallest things. Brothers and sisters, that's the only question I want you to answer in this first khutbah. What are you devoted to? Are we truly committed to Allah? Are we inspired by the Abrahamic sacrifice or not? And are we willing to sacrifice, to make the sacrifices which are very minor that Allah is asking us to make? to sacrifice our own perspectives or thoughts or ideas. You know, we think this religion is difficult. It has so many prohibitions. You can't drink, you can't fornicate, you can't have a girlfriend or a boyfriend. You have to wear a hijab. These things are hard. This religion is hard. I can't sacrifice. Look at what people are saying about us today. Islam is on the receiving end of a lot of critique. My peers, they're telling me, what kind of antiquated backwards religion are you following? There's too much pressure. I'm hurting. I'm sad. I'm worried. I'm scared. I can't make the sacrifice. Is that who I am? Is that who we are? That's the question that I want us to ask. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the willingness and the capacity to make the Abrahamic sacrifice to live in accordance with the family of Ibrahim, to follow in the footsteps of Ibrahim and Hajar and Ismail alayhim salam, to make us those who are undoubtedly devout to him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and who are willing to sacrifice everything for his sake. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah wa lakum. Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu 
ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا اوصي نفسي واياكم بتقوى الله وبلزوم طاعته يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون ان الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا ايها الذين امنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما Brothers and sisters, I want to close by addressing a contentious issue that surfaced with this Eid al-Adha. As we know, Monday, we will be celebrating the great Eid of al-Adha. And this, for us as Muslims, is one of our greatest celebrations in the year. But it just so happened that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed it that the day before Eid al-Adha is September 11th, which is a date for us as Americans where we mourn the tragic loss of 2,996 lives 16 years ago. And obviously, there is a very difficult circumstance that has surfaced is how do we Muslims reconcile between the fact that on Monday, September 12th, we will be celebrating Eid, coming together as a community and families, and the day before that, as Americans, we'll be mourning the loss of lives 16 years ago. Obviously, something very difficult to reconcile, especially in our current climate, where Islam is not, let's just say, favorable in our public discourse. And this is even more challenging to reconcile for Muslims who lost loved ones on September 11th. Because 300 plus Muslims died on September 11th. And so there are Muslims in our community who will be mourning on Sunday, and then they have to go and be devout and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on Monday. And as we all know, we've been biting our nails for the past weeks because there was a possibility that Eid al-Adha would, would fall on September 11th. And everyone was concerned, clamoring for words. How do we even address this meaningfully? And subhanAllah, that's in and of itself an indication that as a Muslim community, we don't have control over this. We don't have control over when Allah decrees that we are to worship Him and when we are to celebrate. It is His decree. He puts date and time. And we say, Ya Allah, we hear and we obey. But I know that this is not sufficient, that this won't work. People don't accept it. Muslims, how can you be so heartless? Where's your empathy? You guys are already in hot waters. Are you sure you want to celebrate on Monday? the day after September 11th? So what do we say? I tried to hint in the first khutbah and illustrate that our celebration, our celebrations as Muslims are not empty parties. As Muslims, we don't just mindlessly party. That's not what we're about. Our celebrations are decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for very distinct reasons. We celebrate the legacy of God's prophets. Ibrahim alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ajma'een. Our celebration is a moment of tremendous introspection and reflection to ask ourselves, what are we truly committed to as followers of La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah? And to illustrate this fact, to show that we don't just mindlessly party, look at the sermon of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he himself gave on Eid al-Adha. What was the message that he gave to the thousands of companions that were sitting in front of him. He stood, 
just like this time 1400 years ago in his only Hajj that he ever made just as our brothers and sisters are in pilgrimage the Prophet was making his only pilgrimage and it was his last sermon and he stood on the day of Eid and he said to his people what is today and so the companion said Ya Rasulullah Allah, Allah wa Rasuluhu A'lam only Allah and his messenger know Subhanallah you know that is just a powerful response these are individuals who after 23 years of transformation not only did they begin to put Allah and his messenger before them in every aspect of their life but now when the Prophet is asking such an obvious question what is today they pause and they say maybe Allah and his messenger have some, something else in store for us so instead of answering they say Allahu wa Rasuluhu A'lam and so the Prophet says Alaysa yawmun nahr is not today the day of Eid Bala ya Rasulullah yes indeed it is the day of Eid and then he asks ayyu shahrin hadha what is this month that you're in Allahu wa Rasuluhu A'lam and then he says Alaysa Dhul Hijjah, is this not the month, the sacred month of Dhul Hijjah? Bala ya Rasulullah, indeed it is. Ayu baladin hadha, what land is this that we are in? Allahu wa Rasuluhu alam, only Allah and His Messenger know, is this not the sacred land of Mecca? Yes, indeed, ya Rasulullah, it is. So the Prophet says, then hear me, listen to me. فَإِنَّ دِمَاءَكُمْ وَأَمْوَالَكُمْ وَأَعْرَاضَكُمْ حَرَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ حَرَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ حَرَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ كَحُرْمَةِ يَوْمِكُمْ هَذَا فِي شَهْرِكُمْ هَذَا فِي بَلَدِكُمْ هَذَا Allahu Akbar The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said if you know that today is Eid today is Dhul Hijjah we are in Mecca, the sacred lands of Mecca, then listen to what I have to say to you. My parting words. He said, verily, the human life is sacred. Material belongings of human being are sacred. Human dignity is sacred. Just as today is a sacred day in this sacred month, in this sacred place. That was the message of our beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the day of Eid 1400 years ago. The legacy that he was leaving for us to embody was the knowledge that the human being is a sacred being to be protected, that no innocent life is to ever be spilt in that egregious way. That people's belongings must be honored and protected and that the dignity of every breathing soul must be honored and is sacred in the sight of Allah. That was his message on the day of Eid. It wasn't a mindless party. It was to say, that yes, we are celebrating today, but we are celebrating virtue. We are celebrating what it means to be servants of God on this earth, what it means to be protectors and caretakers and stewards on this earth. And so he said, فَلْيُبَلِّغْ الشَّاهِدْ الْغَائِبْ Then let the one who witnesses what I'm saying relay this to the ones who are not here. لا ترجعوا بعد يا كفارا. Don't go back to the way you were, he said. Killing one another, spilling each other's blood. That is exactly what he said. I want you to relay this message to mankind. Don't go back to the reality of spilling blood mindlessly. That's not my way. And that's not the way of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. اللهم هل بلغت اللهم فشهد he said oh Allah have I delivered the message oh Allah you are my witness I have and so brothers and sisters today and on the day of Eid in these days 
What we are reviving is a prophetic spirit that goes back to honoring the human life, the way that Allah decreed that the human life should be honored. That's what we are trying to revive. Because the fact is simple. We live in a world that is very sick. Our world is in pain. 16 years after 9-11, this world is in a bad shape. We know that. Innocent people are still being killed every single day. Whether it's a young black man on our own streets, or a child in Aleppo in Syria, or what's happening anywhere across the world to Muslims and non-Muslims, there is a lot of pain in this world. And so yes, during this time, during Eid and during the commemoration of September 11th, we go back to our prophetic values. That's what we need to revive. That's what this world is in need of. So there is no contention. The question is not, why are you celebrating Eid al-Adha? Is, why are we not celebrating? We have to. Because our celebration is one that revives these principles, that reminds us of these principles. That's why our scholars throughout the centuries, from their practice on the day of Eid, was the first thing they would do was go visit the grave. Did you know that? They would go visit the graves to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To understand that we're going to that point. What are we doing for the deen of Allah? What are we doing for God's creation? Then they would go and visit the sick, visit the needy, they would mend broken relationships and broken hearts. They would visit their family. They would spread joy. Because in a world with so much pain, what Muslims need to be is what the Prophet ﷺ was, and that is a mercy to mankind. We have to be agents that spread mercy, compassion, empathy, love, and care. That's the way of our prophets, and that is the legacy that we are trying to revive in these days. May Allah grant us the foresight to follow in their footsteps. May Allah grant us the capacity to revive their spirit, revive their ethics, their virtues, and their ideals. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use us to heal the pains of this world, to be people who bring back dignity to human life, who ensure that the possessions of people across the world are sacred and must be protected who ensure that every human soul deserves dignity. That is what the Prophet called us towards, and that is what we must uphold. I ask Allah to forgive our sins and our shortcomings. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with us, forgive us, allow us to be uplifted in the best of states, to be in the presence of our beloved Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan wa ita'i dhil qurba wa yanha anil fahshai wal munkari wal baghi ya'idhukum la'allakum tadhakkaroon wa la dhikru Allahi akbar wa Allahu ya'lamu ma tasna'oon.